but Ukrainian officials are now warning Russia is preparing to launch an all-out assault on Kyiv. Let's get the take from Brigadier Paul Gibson on this one. He's a former director of counterterrorism and UK operations in Iraq. Um, so would we be right in assuming, uh, and it's very hard to verify anything really, that um, the Russian advance has stalled? I think the uh, Russians have not achieved the objectives they've probably set themselves in those early, early days. They've been stalled by uh, a heroic defence by the Ukrainian forces, which we've heard a lot about. But I think that defence has been clever. Um, they've used anti-tank weapons in small groups, uh, attacking rear, rear echelons. So when you say in small groups, that means they're hard for Russians to target. Indeed. Indeed. So yeah. where the Russian advantage was in cyber, where they yeah. could uh, uh, interfere with people's uh, command and control systems, if you're working in small groups independently, it's much harder to do so. They've blown up bridges. Uh, they didn't illuminate their air defence systems early on, so they were hidden, and now they're popping up, and they've been widely dispersed. So the Russians can't control airspace. Uh, they're having to move uh, into night operations, using helicopters mainly at night uh, because they're being shot down. So all of this is stalling the Russian advance. They've also taken a lot of casualties. Uh, I thought it was interesting yesterday, the chief of defence staff, comparing the Russian losses to being more in a week than the British army lost uh, in 20 years in Afghanistan. Fantastic. Now, so how long can you sustain those, that level of ca uh, casualties? And I think the other thing the Russians are finding is that having taken a town, taken a village, then securing it, preventing further attacks and dealing with the local population who they expected to be friendly towards them, who are being very, very, the very opposite of that, is proving very difficult as well. So my question, I suppose, in all of this is, was Putin incredibly naive thinking he could get, you know, topple a country of 45 million people in a week? Or have the Ukrainians surprised expectations? And you, you referenced Admiral Sir Tony Radican. He's obviously our top military man in this country. And he's been talking about, as you say, how troops have been decimated from the Russian side in the last week. Yes. Uh, I think probably that uh, Putin has overestimated the capability of the Russian armed forces and underestimated the Ukrainian defence. I mean, no military plan survives contact with the enemy, and this is very clear in this case. Um, and some of their elite units are taking significant hits. And you see this great convoy that everybody keeps talking about. It is largely a logistic convoy going down a single road, expecting to be waved on as it goes into um, the capital. That has not happened. It's now being picked off. It's bogged down. We've got reports of officers leaving the convoy um, because it's just being attacked all the time. It's just too dangerous. Yeah. Let me put something else to you, uh, Brigadier. Um, we talk about the Russian atrocities. We talk about Putin and his, uh, you know, just insufferable sort of attacks here. But maybe he's holding back. Maybe he actually can't do everything that he wants. He's got the might. He's got the firepower. And maybe international, uh, although how horrific it is, maybe the whole international audience uh, is actually preventing him from doing what he wants to do. Well, I think, again, you would imagine he's been very surprised by the unity of the response from the, uh, from the developed world and, and elsewhere. Um, so that will have surprised him. And I'm not sure it will have altered his determination. I think what he will continue to do is grind on. I mean, I'm very sad to say, sitting here, but this could easily drag into weeks and months mm -hmm. because they still, despite the limitations, despite the heroic yeah. defence, it is a lot of mass there. There are a lot of tanks and artillery and fast aircraft. But why doesn't he just use air power? Well, I think, again, it's slightly to do with the Ukrainian defence. He would have hoped by now that his, his fast air could operate without any concerns. That is not the case. So the, the aircraft are having to take a lot of defensive measures and are less able to provide that close air support to the ground troops. Um, I just want to ask you about um, the FSB. Obviously, this is the special forces under Putin. And there were reports that um, they were tipping off uh, President Zelensky about possible uh, decapitation moves. That is indicative, isn't it, of low morale, if that's happening within the special forces in Russia. And could that be the undoing of Putin? I mean, that's... Uh... Yeah, obviously, that, I haven't seen the evidence for that, but I have seen, like you have, those reports. Mm. 
I mean, I think, yes, that would be extraordinary. If, if an elite group, an intelligence agency uh, with those sort of capabilities is briefing the enemy, as is in this case, that is very dangerous area for Putin, very dangerous indeed. Um, what about the, the deal the Americans have been doing with the Poles overnight to try and provide backup uh, aircraft so that the Polish planes can go into Ukraine? How much of a difference will that make? I mean, lots of experts saying World War Three has already started. And I know Putin said that if any uh, air support comes in from other countries, they're at war with him. Well, it does seem that we're on a slightly slippery slope here, that on... Uh, we rule out a no-fly zone. We rule out fl um, providing directly aircraft from, from the US um, to the Ukrainians. But now we're doing some sort of deal with the Poles to allow American aircraft to go to Poland and then their aircraft to go into Ukraine. So I think this is, this is really interesting territory because I don't accept that we're at Third World War. And I know that my colleagues are working desperately hard to avoid mm. that. That is why they take the no-fly zone off. Um, but it is, it, it is a, a, a slip. And, you know, if, if those pilots, what are they, Polish pilots, NATO pilots, possibly? I mean, this idea that you can take a fast yeah, jet yeah, yeah, you and just, just hand, you hand the keys the over. There you are. There are the keys. Exactly. You go but that's exactly. the problem yeah. with yeah. supplying all of this lethal yeah. aid, isn't it? That we, ha, Who actually knows how to operate any of it, well, whether it's planes I mean, or tanks or whatever? You can differentiate. I mean, you can train a, a, an individual on an anti-tank weapon system if he's already a trained soldier, you know, in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, you can't do that with a fast jet. So I think there's, um, there's some loose thinking around some of these issues, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but one understands the sentiment. People are desperate to help the Ukrainians in any way they can. You know, you are a commander, former commander of armoured groups. Um, I, we see all these pictures of armoured cars, tanks uh, here uh, from the Russians in Ukraine. Do you get any sort of sense? But I, I never see pictures of, you know, five or six tanks together. You see individual tanks or whatever. What, would you watch and scratch your head looking at all this stuff? I mean, can you see a joined up plan here or? Well, I, I mean, I'm completely with you. It I mean, of course, we're relying on a certain amount of footage, so we're not really yes. seeing the battle picture. But you're right. In order to be successful, you bring mass to bear at a particular point. And it's, it's, it's like playing an orchestra. You get the artillery, you get the mortars, you have the tanks manoeuvring, then you have the armoured infantry coming up behind. All that has to be orchestrated and delivered so that you, at the moment that you want to deliver that kinetic energy, you've got it all working to, together. I don't see evidence of that. One of my fascinations is I, I'm a great student of World War II and you can have all this hardware, but if you don't have... We, we talk about the logistics in this um, convoy that there is and people seem to think they're not yeah. important, but, I mean, if you get rid of those, it's very important because everything else breaks down. But keeping armoured hardware on the road, maintaining it, it can be quite temperamental. It needs fuel for a start. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I'm old enough to know so some of the early days of sort of chieftain tanks and yeah. they just lost their tracks every five minutes. It's a constant, constant battle just to keep them on the road, keep them fueled up, keep them with ammunition, keep them going in the right direction. That is a huge logistic challenge and you have to have that logistic element right behind your armoured units. And that's, at the moment, that's not happening for them. It's bogged down elsewhere. Um, I suppose I have to ask you a question about the civilians because most of the papers this morning carry pictures of either Ukrainian forces helping buggies over, you know, into safe zones or children, women, whoever it might be, terrible scenes over the weekend. Uh, this attempt to create a humanitarian corridor has been unsuccessful so far. The big fear, I suppose, is that what we're seeing is the more frustrated President Putin gets with his progress in Ukraine is he's doing a bit more of a sort of Chechnya playbook, what he did on Grozny, where civilians pay the awful toll, huge numbers killed there. Yeah. I mean, I think we should be clear. If you're fighting in an urban area, civilians are going to get caught up in this. I mean, if, if a sniper attacks you from a, <clears throat> a, a block of flats, mm. well, you're going to hit that. Well, not a ceasefire. So, no, but there, so there's, but there is that diff, really difficult thing. So I'm afraid civilians are, if they're in the streets, in those residential blocks, they're going to get caught up in this. So that's the really sad reality of that. I think the ceasefire is interesting insofar as um, it sort of suggests that the Russians aren't in complete control of what's going on in terms of saying to the whole of their brigade, division, 
there's going to be a ceasefire. It's going to come in at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. This is the humanitarian corridor. They don't seem to be able to deliver that. Or they don't care. Or they don't care. Uh, and I think, you know, the jury's probably out of that. And I know they're going to have another go today. Mm. Um, but that is essential. And in terms of, you know, I'm here to talk about military mm. stuff. But actually, it's the diplomatic channels have got to be open now. They've got to put pressure on Putin to say, whatever you're trying to achieve here, you've got to open these humanitarian corridors. You've got to help people get to safety. 